Hello, I'm uh, Drew uh, Fustini. This is my first FOSDEM. I've been watching uh, videos for many years, uh, so this is my first time actually getting here. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Um, actually, I'm from Chicago, but I moved to Berlin uh, this past year. Um, so I'm in the area now. Um, I'm part of the BeagleBoard or Dark Foundation. We make small single board uh, computers, um, most popularly known as the BeagleBone. Um, also part of the Open Source Hardware Association. Um, this is a group that um, we have an open source hardware certification program. Um, and I mentioned Berlin. If you are in the area, in a couple of weeks, we have the Berlin Embedded Linux meetup. Um, so if you're around, uh, we'd love to have you stop by that. Um, and then on March 13th in New York City, um, the Open Source Hardware Association, we organize an annual uh, conference called the Open Hardware Summit. So if you're able to, this will be on March 13th um, in New York City. Um, and since I mentioned open source hardware, just want to give a brief introduction of what that is. Um, so it's hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the hardware, help sell the design or hardware based on the design. Um, so for electronics, which is mostly what I do, um, that'd be the schematic, you'd be sharing the schematics, the board layout. Um, in the editable source file, so if you're using a program like KeyCAD, you would share your board file and your schematic file, um, and then also the bill of materials. Um, and one of the best practices, if you want to do this, is to make sure that the bill of materials, um, you have the components are available in a small quantity. Um, so like with uh, BeagleBone, we make sure that all the components are available in quantity of one from distributors. Um, and the reason for... Oh, I also gave a talk at CCC recently that I go more into depth about like open source hardware, um, some of the different licensing, and also some of the different open source hardware boards that run Linux. So if you're interested in that, you can check out my 36.3c talk. Um, but going back to the open source hardware, why would you do this? Um, I would say the main reason to do it is you want to enable other people to collaborate on your hardware project. Um, so by sharing your um, schematics and your board layouts and editable format, you can get people to contribute back changes to your project. And if you make the components available, um, if you choose components that are available through distribution, people can actually build your project. So um, I'm very excited right now about RISC-V, um, which is an um, open instruction set. Um, so what's an instruction set? So probably many of you have heard of x86 or ARM. These are um, instruction sets, which is essentially the standard for uh, what tasks a processor can do at a low level, the instructions that the processor can execute. Um, though with both x86 from Intel and AMD and um, the ARM instruction sets, they're all proprietary. Um, so if we want to make like an open source chip, we need to have an open source instruction set. So RISC-V, um, I think it's about 10 years ago now, they, it was started by a group at Berkeley that was doing uh, computer architecture research. So RISC-V is a free and open instruction set. Um, I believe it's licensed under Creative Commons, the standard is, so anyone can take that instruction set and implement it. Um, there's a couple of great talks if you want to get more in depth on RISC-V. Um, one is from David Patterson, who's one of the people that originally um, started RISC back in the, the early 80s. Um, and then also Chris uh, Asanovich, uh, who's the professor at Berkeley that was leading the RISC V team. Um, and he does this talk at um, probably like every six months at these RISC V conferences. So it's always kind of changing because uh, there's a lot of development going on. So if you ever want to check out, like deep dive into what the current state of affairs is with, with RISC V, is they do the State of the Union probably like every six months. Um, so. One of the things about RISC-V was the idea was to make it a modular ISA that you could um, be extensible. So to make it last for something that's going to be valid a decade from now, two decades from now, they wanted it to be something where they're planning for the future. So there's 32-bit, 64-bit, and there's also 128-bit um, version of uh, the RISC-V instruction set. So the idea being that um, you know, once we have petabytes of memory, we'll, we'll still be able to address all that memory. Um, yeah, so going back to the project beginning, I guess, in 2011, um, all the way up to now, we, we have um, a bunch of different companies that are involved now, um, and the ecosystem is probably the most important thing, the software ecosystem. So it's fine to have an instruction set, but it's not worth it's not that valuable if you don't have support in compilers and tools and operating systems. Um, so there's support in GCC, LLVM, Linux kernel. Um, free RTOS, now Zephyr, so pretty much everything that you need um, to have a system that you can develop and build and, and put into production. 
So this kind of gives you a bit of a um, bit of an insight into the instruction set. So it actually is a very small base. So the base of the ISA is just a 32-bit integer. So that's all the bases for RISC V. So um, you can write software for this base ISA, 32-bit integer, uh, and you'll be able to run that on a. In the future, we have some like. 10 core 128 bit RISC V processor, it'll still be able to run this base ISA, which is frozen. Um, but then there's lots of extensions. So this is the RISC V 32 bit integer. Um, and then there's a bunch of extensions as well. Um, so David Harrison gave this talk, and in his pocket there is what is called the green card. So I guess back in the day when people were um, programming um, machines with, like, you know, terminals and teletypes and stuff like that, they would have these um, cards that showed all the instructions for the, um, for the CPU. Um, so this is the uh, RISC-V equivalent of the green card. So you can see here, this is just the instructions for the base ISA, which is the 32-bit integer. Um, and it's maybe like 20, 30 instructions. Um, and then this is for all the current extensions. So we have 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit. And then there's like a multiply and divide, um, different versions of uh, floating point, um, compressed instructions. So um, even putting all that together, it's still not, still not that much. It's not overwhelming. And it's architected so that you can um, just choose the extensions that you need for your use case. So um, it was started at Berkeley, the team at Berkeley. They now transitioned it where it's being organized by um, something called the RISC-V Foundation. So the standard um, lives at uh, RISC-V.org. Um, they also have been growing a lot. So I think they have over 400 members now, which is companies and universities. Um, you can also become an individual member as well of the foundation. Um, and one of the reasons to join um, for companies and universities is they can join these working groups where they're um, uh, setting these new extensions. Uh, like one of the things I think is in the works right now is uh, vector extensions, um, so in hypervisors, and so these sorts of things that are adding to the base ISA. You can join the foundation and get involved with um, shaping those. Um, and companies like NVIDIA um, is um, using the RISC-V as kind of like a management controller. They replaced their own proprietary ISA in their um, graphics card. Not the GPU, but something that helps manage um, the, the device. Um, and then Western Digital is probably one of the most heavily involved companies, and they're replacing all the controllers in their drives um, to be based on RISC-V. Um, so in, in the future, NVIDIA and Western Digital and other companies will be shipping millions of devices every year um, with RISC-V um, processors in it. Um, one of the things companies, companies can get when they do this is they don't have to pay licensing fees for proprietary ISAs and proprietary implementations. But more than that, they get the freedom to um, implement um, it as they want. Like, I think with ARM, you have to have an architecture license if you want to do substantial changes to the microarchitecture, which I think only a few companies have, like Qualcomm and Apple. Everyone else, like with BeagleBone, we use TI um, parts. And I think TI just licenses a, a specific core uh, from ARM. So if you want to make more changes to like the microarchitecture, you oftentimes can't do that. Whereas with RISC-V, you're free to do that. There's also a lot of open source implementation. So Boom and Rocket from Berkeley and uh, Pulp is out of ETH Zurich um, and Swerve, which I think is the Western digital one. So there's a lot of open source implementations. Also yesterday, there was a talk from uh, Open Python um, out of Princeton. Um, they also have this uh, uh, kind of one-to-many uh, core design uh, capable of running Linux. Um, called Open Python. So there's a lot of existing projects out there that people can leverage. And there's this event. Um, I guess it used to be called the RISC-V Workshop. I think now it's called the RISC-V Summit. But these things happen like every six months. So if you're wondering what's the latest and greatest that's happening with RISC-V, is you can, you can go to RISC-V.org. And they just put up the proceedings and the videos from the one that they had in December uh, in California. So if you go to the RISC-V YouTube channel, um, there's tons and tons of talks on there. I think one of, the, one of the main ways I've been able to kind of find out what's happening in this community is watching a lot of these videos. So one of the other things I find interesting is um, kind of the global sense of RISC-V. Um, and one point is that the RISC-V Foundation was based in the US. They're now moving to Switzerland. Um, and, and part of that is to be free of political implications. Um, uh, nations like India and I think also Pakistan have declared that RISC-V is going to be their national architecture. And I think that um, 
a lot of countries want to have more control over technology, want to have more sovereign control over process architecture, processor architecture. So, um, you know, in this past year, we saw the U.S. Um, prevent, or the U.S. current presidential administration prevent uh, U.S. companies from doing business with Huawei. And, and back at the beginning of last year, it was also uncertain if ARM would be able to do business with Huawei. They ended up deciding it was okay because ARM's a UK-based technology, but um, you know, I'm sure a lot of Chinese companies don't want to be don't want to be in the position of not being able to license uh, uh, the cores that they need um, from ARM. So I think there's a lot of motivation for um, companies in China and other nations to have more control over the processor technology. And I think like the the biggest um, uptake in RISC-V Foundation um, membership has come from China recently. Uh, I tried to kind of give an overview, the, overview of this in a recent issue of Hackspace Magazine. Um, it's, just, it's a short column, but um, if you're just trying to get a sense of what's going on in RISC-V, it's a, hopefully a, a good way to, in like a few minutes, get up to speed. So the first time I saw a RISC-V chip was the OpenV, which was a microcontroller from a group in Columbia, a uh, Colombian university. Um, they call themselves OnChip. I think the university is UIS. Um, but this was a 32-bit uh, microcontroller, um, and it was a completely open source um, implementation. Um, they also did analog, which um, was kind of unique about their project, is they were interested in the analog peripherals. Uh, one of the other organizations that I've been watching for a few years now is Low Risk. Um, so Low Risk is a not-for-profit uh, organization out of the UK. Um, and I like that their mission statement when they started was they wanted to create a um, system on chip, completely open source, that you could use to build a single board computer. Um, some of the people that started Low Risk had been involved in Raspberry Pi, so I was really excited, like, ooh, we could get like, a fully open source uh, single board computer. Um, most recently, they've been working with Google on this security project called Open Titan. Um, but you can um, you can try out um, their SOC and run Linux on it. So there's a version 0.7 of the low risk uh, release right now, and you can get a FPGA development board for less than $300, and you can actually run like a, a little graphical uh, Linux environment on it. So if you follow this tutorial, I just found out about this like on like two days ago from someone here at FOSDEM, so I'm, I'm eager to go try this out myself. Um, so that's kind of like their long-term vision, I think, is to have a, a, you know, an SOC that's produced in volume that you could use to run um, Linux on. Um, Alex Bradbury is one of the people involved in low risk, and he gave an interesting talk about the ecosystem for operating systems um, and the tool support around it um, last year in the summer. So, one of the, I'm, so I'm part of the Open Source Hardware Association, um, and kind of I would say the equivalent to that to some degree is the um, Free and Open Source Silicon Initiative uh, for chip design. So they're a great organization. They organize several events throughout the year. So they have OrConf, um, which happens every year here in Europe, um, which is, stands for Open Risk uh, Conference, um, but there's a lot of RISC-V content there now as well. Um, they started doing an event in the U.S. called Latch Up. So last year it was in Portland, and this April um, it's going to be at MIT in the U.S. In last past year they also did a week uh, week of open source hardware uh, at uh, Zero, uh, ETH Zurich. Um, so they're a great place to find out like what's going on with um, beyond just Risk Five as well, but with um, open source chip design. And they now run a website called Libre Cores. Um, which you might have firmly heard of as uh, Open Core, so this is kind of the successor to that. The idea is to aggregate together um, processor designs. So, you know, if you need to get a controller for SPI or you need to find like a USB controller, you could potentially go on LibreCore. So they're trying to set up a way for you to have a place to go to if you want to share your um, chip design IP. And if you're looking for something, um, you could potentially go on there and find it. So some of the people that were at Berkeley that um, created the uh, RISC-V um, ISA originally went on to start a company called Sci-5, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, I think it was maybe two or three years ago now, they launched this microcontroller called the FE310. Um, so this is kind of an Arduino form factor board that has the FE310 in it. Um, so this is nice. 
Um, it's interesting, but I really want to have a system I can run Linux on. So I was really excited here at FOSDEM two years ago, I think it was, um, that Palmer um, unveiled the uh, sci 5 Unleashed, which is their 64-bit um, quad-core 64-bit um, Linux SOC. So there's a board called the Hi5 Unleashed, which is a pretty exciting board. Um, it's open hardware. Um, it is unfortunately $1,000 because they only made 1,000 of them, I believe. The idea with this was to be something for like early access for developers. Um, so this is one option that a lot of people are using um, that have access to it for doing like bring up of distros and tools and things like that. So um, it's probably like the highest performance RISC V board you can get right now, um, but it is expensive and only available in limited quantities. So um, Fedora actually has a RISC V um, a port as, uh, right now, um, and they've been using the uh, Unleashed board um, to bring it up and also uh, QAMU. Um, so there was this talk back in December at the RISC V Summit um, from one of the people involved. And here is them running um, a, a GNOME on uh, the Siphon of Unleashed board, which requires a lot of hardware, um, which is probably not something you would probably want to set up um, if you weren't at one of these companies that's bringing up um, you know, something like Fedora. But um, here's a, you know, an image of what it might look like in a few years if, if you um, have a RISC-V system and you're running a a Linux desktop on it. Um, so the Sci-5 solution with the Unleashed board and this FPGA board that does the graphics is quite expensive. So the thing that's much more accessible to everyone is QEMU. So you can, with just your computer that you have right now, your x86 computer, um, you can download QEMU and the Fedora image, you can run it on your computer, um, which is the way a lot of the work is being done right now for people that are um, bringing up uh, risk five tool chains and distros and things like that. So here's an example of booting the Fedora risk five. So if you have the sci-fi board, then this is the flow, but not that many people do. So most people are just working with um, QEMU. Um, so if you want to get started right now, and you don't have any hardware, QEMU with um, Fedora is one way to do it. Um, there is also Debian. So Debian also has a port. Uh, for um, RISC V 64 uh, bit as well. So you can either grab Debian or Fedora and go ahead and start running it on your system with um, QEMU. Now, there is a microcontroller um, or smaller processor um, from a company called Kendrite. So this is a really cheap um, processor. It's a dual core 64 bit, um, it's 400 megahertz with 8 megabytes of SRAM, which is pretty decent for like a microcontroller. Um, and you can get like dev boards from a bunch of places. Seed Studio has one for $13. So like a really inexpensive RISC-V development board. Um, now, can you run Linux on it? So there's a person at Western Digital, um, Damien, who's been hacking away at it. And there's a couple of Linux kernel hackers that have been working on it um, with somewhat limited success. So Damien gave a talk back at um, Linux Plumbers in September um, about trying to run it. So. One of the issues with this Kendrite chip is that um, technically it has an MMU, but it's not the right type of MMU. So you have to run it with, with MMUs at memory management unit. So normally on your computer, in most things that are running Linux, you have a memory management unit. And um, if you don't have that, you have to kind of take a path that's atypical. Um, so you need to have no MMU support in your libraries and Linux and stuff like that. Linux now has that capability um, in it uh, to run as M mode. So with RISC-V, there's machine mode and supervisor mode. So machine mode is just like we're just running with a unified memory um, view, not with a, like virtual memory and user space and kernel space. So um, right now, um, they're still kind of hacking away on it. But um, if they're able to get it working, or if you're interested yourself, you can, you can check out um, uh, here's some links. Uh, so here's a screenshot of them booting uh, Linux on that Cypede board that's $13. Um, but it only kind of gets to this point, um, basically logging into BusyBox. Um, and one of the reasons is, is with Audit MMU, you need, um, I think it's FTPIC support, uh, which is an, an ARM way of dealing with the fact that you don't have um, virtual memory. Um, so. Basically, it's work in progress. If they're able to 
progress it farther, then we can probably start running Risk V on really inexpensive sub twenty dollar boards um, and playing around with it. It only has eight megabytes of memory though, so how useful will it be? I'm not sure, but for now, QMU is probably the the way to go. Um, however, coming up in uh, this year uh, is three processors that I'm I'm kind of excited about from having watched some of these uh, talks at the Risk V Summit. So. Andes has a processor that's coming out um, that's supposed to be Linux capable. They're saying Q1 of 2020. Um, microchip, uh, formerly MicroSemi, they have kind of what would be the equivalent to the Xilinx Zinc. So this is going to be a FPGA with a hard uh, RISC-V core, uh, and that's called the Polar Fire SoC. And I think they're talking about second half of 2020. Um, and then the one I'm most excited about, uh, which I saw one of my friends tweet about um, at the RISC-V Summit, was NXP is working with this organization called the Open Hardware Group to produce a uh, RISC-V um, IMX-style uh, SoC. So if you've heard of like the Freescale IMX6 or IMX8, they're pretty popular for embedded Linux systems. You see them on a lot of different boards. So I think the idea here is something that has the peripherals that you normally have an IMX system with a RISC-V core instead of a um, ARM core. Um, so this is supposed to be second half of 2020. Um, I think they announced it would be like clocked at 1.5 gigahertz, so pretty high, pretty high performance. It's supposed to have a GPU, so if it's one of those Vivante GPUs that we have the Etnaviv open source drivers for, then I think this would be really exciting. Uh, there's no information on pricing yet, but um, like this might be something that we could actually build like an affordable single board computer with um, that would run Linux. Um, yeah, so by the way, in these slides, there's links to all these different articles if you want to check them out. Um, so one of the things I would love to do is um, get a group of people together that want to help make a uh, cheap Linux uh, capable uh, open source hardware board. I think we kind of have to wait for a chip like this to come out. Um, so if you're interested in, get in touch with me. Um, however, we don't necessarily have to wait for these SOCs because there are also FPGAs, which is what I have here. So this is a FPGA. Um, it's actually a badge with an FPGA on it, and it can actually run Linux on RISC-V. Um, however, this is not going to be the same performance as this. So with the FPGAs, we're talking about maybe 50 megahertz, 100 megahertz, maybe 200 megahertz. Um, so not the same performance that we have in a SOC. So one of the reasons I'm very excited about FPGAs now, like I learned them in school a long time ago, and it was all proprietary IDEs and Windows, and I had to run a VM, and I didn't like it. Um, we now have open source uh, tools for working with FPGAs, which is really exciting. So um, back at Hackaday Super Conference, which this badge is from, uh, a uh, person from Sci-5, Megan Wax, gave an interesting talk about overview of RISC-V and FPGAs. So this is another thing I recommend checking out. Um, if you aren't familiar with what an FPGA is, it's a field programmable gateway. So it's basically a chip that has a bunch of gates in it. Um, like, for example, this one has 45,000 gates. Um, and we can take those gates and reconfigure them to implement whatever digital logic we want, including a processor core. Um, so like this one has a um, soft RISC-V processor. That's the, the fabric that C of gates has been configured to be a uh, processor. Uh, and then the thing for me that has made this more exciting is the fact that we now have free and open source software tools to um, do the synthesis and the place and route um, and load it onto the FPGA. So this started a few years ago. Um, with a group of people, um, most notably Claire Wolf, that um, started building these tools for a lattice FPGA called the ICE-40. It's kind of a modest FPGA, um, but um, it was the first one that had like a free and open source tool chain for it. And that, that referred to as generally as Project Ice Storm. Um, and then <laughs> this is actually an ECP-5 FPGA, so it's much more capable. Um, it can do things like HDMI, um, higher throughput um, things like USB 3, I believe, as well. Um, so this was enabled by the work from uh, David Shaw. Um, so one of the things they have to do with both the ICE-40 and the ECP-5 is document the bitstream. Um, so that work was done in Project Trellis. So we can now use the ECP-5 with these um, free software tools. And hopefully soon, um, some Xilinx parts as well. So Xilinx is like 
kind of the market leader in FPGAs. Um, and if we want to have higher performing parts, um, the sorts of things we probably need if we want to have like a more usable Linux system in a soft core, then the Xilinx parts are going to be probably the best way to do that. Um, so I'm told in the next couple months, you might be able to use one of these Xilinx boards with uh, the free and open source tools. Um, if you can find him, Tim Ansel is here at FOSDEM. Um, he's, he's pushing hard to try and get um, these tools working with Xilinx, so um, he always has the latest information. He gave a talk at uh, Hackaday Supercon back in November, uh, where it's kind of the status of where this is all at. So this board I'm quite excited about is called the Orange Crab. Um, it's from a person in Australia, Greg DeVille. Um, it's a completely open source hardware design. Um, and he's managed to put um, the ECP5 FPG on there, along with 120, 128 megabytes of uh, DDR memory. Um, so it's a nice little small board. Um, that uh, actually can run Linux quite nicely. We were um, at the Chaos Communication Congress, and someone was like, hey, you should run Linux on it. And then like a few hours later, Greg and Tim hacking together, they, got, they brought up Linux on it. So, and I think Linux boots in like 17 seconds on it, so it's actually um, not too bad. I'm, I'm hoping that Greg will um, do a crowdfunding campaign uh, at some point this year for it, because I think this would be a nice board for people to get started with. Um, there's also a board from a hackerspace in uh, Croatia called the Radiona. Um, this one has SD RAM though, so it's not quite as capable as the uh, Orange Crab. But this one will be coming out um, soon from Crowd Supply, I think, in the next month or two. Um, you'd be able to go and uh, back this campaign on Crowd Supply. And then David Shaw, who did the work on Project Trellis, which enabled us to use these tool chains with the ECP5, he created this like ultimate board, um, I think mostly for his own development needs. But this has like a gigabyte of DDR memory, Ethernet, PCI, all these, all these things on there. This is not available. It's something you can buy. You can build one if you want. I think it's probably a couple thousand dollars if you want to build one. But if you're looking for like a high-end um, board for doing uh, using the ECP5 free software tool chain, then this is probably the, the highest end one. One of the things I thought was interesting was uh, someone posted on Twitter um, that uh, what, it, what does it look like when we configure our FPGA to be a, a Linux-capable core? So we can see here, like, this is like the macro view of the place and route utility um, called NextPNR. So this is what it looks like when we've configured all the gates to implement a, a RISC-V processor um, that's capable of running Linux. So this is the badge from the Hackaday Super Conference. Um, it kind of is in a Game Boy style form factor. Um, I think the primary intended thing was for people to um, program games and little graphics on it and walk around with like your name in flames or like Tetris and things like that. So there was a graphics engine and see that you could um, write games on. There were tutorials about how to do this. But there was uh, some of us at uh, Supercon that wanted to run Linux on it. So we were like, oh, that's cool. You can do all these graphics. But let's see if it can boot Linux. Um, so one of the issues with this was it only had, 100, it only had 16 megabytes of uh, SRAM. It's not just it's external SRAM over SPI. So it's quad, quad spy SRAM, which is not really that great for um, trying to run Linux. So we banged our hands against it for, for like the first day and didn't have any success. Um, and then uh, it turned out that someone had showed up to Supercon having already designed a DRAM add-in board. So uh, we were like, oh, we, I think we really need DRAM if we want to boot Linux. And Jacob was there, and he's like, oh, well, I designed this before I came. And we're like, ooh, OK, that's what we need. So uh, he had a board here with uh, 32 megabytes of SD RAM, and that proved to be um, enough for us to be able to get Linux running on it. Um, so that, one of the other things with this badge was the idea was you'd have cartridges. So this is uh, uh, one of the cartridges. Um, there's other ones like for PMOD connectors and different peripherals. Um, so the idea is you, know, you could give someone a cartridge and they plug it into their badge. So this one, you plug it in and you get uh, 32 megabytes of DRAM. Uh, so, but how did we actually get a system on chip into the FPGA that was capable of running Linux? Uh, and the way we in in like a day, pretty much. So, 
The way we did that was with Lidex, um, which is a pretty interesting project um, that is leverages MeGen, which is a Python-based language for doing chip design. So if you've heard of Verilog or VHDL, these are hardware description languages that people use to design um, hardware that goes into chips or into FPGAs. Um, so instead of using Verilog or um, uh, VHDL, you actually program in Python. So it's Python code that actually is describing the hardware, describing the uh, logic inside of the chip, um, and then that can be that produces something that goes into the synth into the synth synthesis tool. Um, so it allows us to basically do chip design in Python, um, which proved to be, I think, pretty powerful because we were able to um, pretty quickly iterate on this and bang away and, and get it working. Uh, Lidex is kind of a combination of a few things. So there's MeGen, which is the domain-specific language based on Python. And I'll show you a, little, a few snippets of MeGen in a bit so you get a flavor for what it looks like. Um, and the other part of Lidex is these um, IP blocks. So there's like a DRAM controller, Ethernet controller, PCI Express controller, SATA. There's a few other ones there. So these are IP that you can go and grab and tie together to build a system on chip um, for your FPGA. Uh, and then the thing specifically that we use is this project called Lidex on Linux. Um, so this takes uh, a RISC-V CPU called the VEX RISC, um, which is a 32-bit um, uh, RISC-V um, CPU that's kind of designed to fit well into an FPGA. So they take that and they take some of this, um, these IP, like the light DRAM controller, Ethernet controller, and they put it all together into an SOC that you can load into your FPGA. So this is um, Linux booting on the... Um, VEX RISC, a uh, RISC V processor inside of that uh, uh, Linux on uh, VEX, Linux on Lidex VEX RISC, uh, um, yeah, it's hard to say. Linux on Lidex VEX RISC V uh, SOC, um, which we still don't have the display working. So, yeah, it's like, to me, this was very exciting. I guess some people like graphics on the display, video games and stuff is more exciting, but we were very excited when we got uh, to see Linux boot um, over the, the UART. Um, so after we got back from Supercon, you know, we were hacking away, trying to get it work on one person's laptop, and then I got home, and I built the board, and then I was like, okay, I want to get it set up, and it took a bit to, like, figure out, okay, what is all the different stuff that we changed when we were at the conference? Uh, finally did that, so there is now upstream support in Linux on Lidex for this Hackaday badge, um, which, you know, only people that are at the conference has the badge, but if you want to have a sense of what it is like to add a new board to Linux on Lidex, you can uh, take a look at these pull requests. Um, also, just to give you a flavor for what the um, uh, Lidex in, in using uh, MeGen, which is Python, looks like. So this is uh, basically the file that defines the board, so the Hackaday badge, Hatch badge, and then this is basically defining the different pins that we have on the badge and how they map to uh, signals inside of the FPGA. So. You know, whereas you might otherwise do this stuff in Verilog or VHDL, here we're doing it in Python. And we have the nice object-orientedness of Python where we can import things and inherent classes and things like that. Um, and then this is also just kind of gives you, gives you a, another sense of what's going on here. So we can, you know, we import things like the uh, LightX clocks and uh, the LightX SD RAM, um, and then we can basically kind of just tell it the parameters that we have for our thing. Uh, hopefully, I have a screenshot in it for for it as well. Uh, yeah, so like we had to add our um, DRAM module because it wasn't already in there. So we're using a a 32 megabyte um, SD RAM module. It wasn't already in LightX, so we just extended what was already there and added a new class where we say, okay, here's our timing. So, you know, from the data sheet, had to figure out the banks and the rows and then basically the timing. And then it kind of uses all the existing infrastructure inside of like DRAM. So kind of made it a minimal amount of effort to have to bring up a new uh, DRAM chip. Uh, and then this is how we uh, like add the board into the build system. So, um, thing here is like, it's pretty basic. If you look at some of the other ones, they have like many, many, many different things that is in the base SOC. So our SOC right now only does serial. Right now I'm trying to get it to add in flash as well, but so it's a pretty basic uh, Lidex on Linux um, SOC. Um, so we just have serial there. And then here is how we actually load the, um, the gateware, which is produced out of our, um, when we do the synthesis. So we just use DFU util, which allows us to load the gateware over USB into the badge. 
Um, so if you take a look at um, the light, Linux on LightX, you can see what some of the other boards look like. Some of them have a lot more capabilities than, than this one. Um, and then it was running really slow. It would take like 300 seconds to boot, which is annoying. Um, so I op this was like a great like GitHub moment or open source development moment uh, where I was like, oh, it's going really slow. And I opened up an issue on the GitHub repo. And then like that same day, um, Enjoy Digital, uh, Florent, who's the person behind LightX, goes by Enjoy Digital, and he posted an improvement, and it was going 10 times faster. So I thought that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good open up a GitHub issue, and all of a sudden it boots in 27 seconds instead of 300 seconds. Um, also, when I was doing this, I discovered this cool thing called ASCII Cinema, which maybe some of you have used before, but it allows you to record your terminal, um, which was really useful. So like, I wanted to show what was happening when the badge was booting up, so I would run ASCII Terminal and record it, and then I could post the link in the GitHub issue, and you could see what was happening. Um, and also, you know, sometimes this doesn't boot when I want to show people stuff, because um, the batteries are dead, so I can always just link people to the uh, ASCII Cinema video. Um, and what specifically what he did um, was interesting. So and kind of shows you the power of I think the the me gen and the object oriented nature of of using Python is um, one of the one of the optimizations was it was having to go to memory too often because um, it's just an eight bit wide memory. So we were having all these expensive memory accesses and it was slowing things down. So he just made the L two cache one hundred twenty eight bit and that speeded it up tremendously. Um, and that might not be like a good optimization for everyone, so it's something that you can play around with and, and optimize it for your use case. And I played around with this number a few times, putting up to 256, to shave off like a couple more seconds. So um, to me, it was quite powerful. I can just go in there and change these values and go and load it up and see how long it takes and see if that improved it or not. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I can hopefully show you what it looks like in the terminal. So. This is, uh, we're hooked up over UART here, and um, what LightX does right now is it just runs BusyBox, um, which if anyone's interested, I think it would be interesting to do something more, like maybe uh, Debian uh, Bootstrap or something like that. So um, it's an area of active development. The other thing, too, is there's drivers for the Linux kernel, like UART and um, the other peripherals that we have in there. Um, so if you're interested in, in those sorts of things, if you check out LightX on Linux, there's a lot of opportunities for people to get involved. Um, so let's log in to our system here. So ooh, we have uh, Linux running uh, on a RISC-V processor and an FPGA using all open source tools, which is pretty fun, I think. So uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll do this first and, and then that one. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic, thank you. I mean, I too have been waiting since I was at uni to be able to play with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I started out with uh, the Black Eyes NX um, Technologies yeah. board, yeah. Um, and I got Zephyr going on top of Saxon, so mm. I'm doing that. And this is I need to have a slide for that, yeah. Yeah, so, that's cool. uh, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, and again, totally open down to the gates. So I want to be able to put together securable IoT solutions that are just completely open in this way, yeah? So the next step is is to try to follow you know what you're doing. You're putting Linux onto these boards, yeah, um, which is very exciting. And I, I, you know, I've taken down some of the examples of boards to get going with. Now, in, in commercial terms, if we're trying to manufacture boards, um, you know, obviously we can go out and get ASICs. It's really exciting to see that NXP are coming out with a risk five. Yeah, we do a lot of work with that. Um, talking to my colleague who does the hardware side of things. He's a bit sniffy about all this, you know, because he says, well, FPGAs, they're expensive. You know, how do we make this stuff cheap? How do we make it viable? I really want to see completely custom cores with standard soft cores in them and then some custom magic to do acceleration and sort of build our own open cores in that way. I've heard that there's Libra Silicon, which is a project yeah. for kind of small-scale ASIC manufacturing. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you know anything about the economics of how this is going to be possible to drive down co cost, like open silicon cores that we can put together. Yeah, so I, the question was about um, open silicon and, and the idea of pushing this down and, and getting things manufactured for cheaper. Um, so I learned some more in about that yesterday, I think. Um, there was a, uh, 
a talk, or actually I ran into the person that does a thing called Chips for Makers, where he's trying to produce his own uh, SOC. Um, and he's trying to push down the cost by like grouping things together. So there's the Chips for Makers. I also saw some of the Libre Silicon stuff. So there's a group actually called Libre Silicon, um, and they're trying to have like an open source fab technique. So they, I think they're working in a fab in Hong Kong, trying to like bring down the cross. So uh, there's the Libre Silicon people, and they're also trying to create like these cell libraries. I think the downside to that is it's a pretty old um, technology process. Um, so um, the one thing I have heard of that maybe, maybe will help, at least in terms of not having to pay for software tools, is yesterday in the Open Python talk um, in the CAD tools room, they were talking about having a ED, chip EDA tools that are open source now. So there's a project called Open Roads um, uh, out of, I think, UC uh, San Diego. Uh, and they're creating like an open source tool flow for doing chip design. Um, so at least maybe that'll eliminate some of the cost of having to pay for these expensive proprietary tools. Um, though I think most of that is still going through TSMC. Um, so uh, the Libre Silicon people, the ones I know of that are trying to like do their own fab technology, um, but it is like older processes. Um, so. And the other thing, too, just I should mention is Sax. So I was talking a lot about LightX on Linux. There's another project called Saxon SOC, S-A-X-O-N-S-O-C. Um, so that's another option for running uh, RISC V, Linux on RISC V, and FPGAs as well. Yeah? So what can you tell us about the Open Source Hardware Summit badge? Uh, I have the PCB somewhere. So this is sadly not Linux. Um, we're using a uh, Nordic microcontroller. Um, but it's going to be a wristwatch-style uh, um, uh, form factor badge. So we were inspired by the uh, badge from uh, camp this year at uh, Chaos Communications Camp called the Cardio. Um, so the idea is a uh, wristwatch form factor badge running Circuit Python. Um, yes, not risk five, but um, uh, hopefully people have fun with it. Uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to add that if you're finding the For the Kendride or? No, no, oh. it's uh, from Gigadevice. It's a microphone. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, for. Yes. Yes, so if people are interested in RISC V microcontrollers, there's a company called Gigadevices that has a really inexpensive um, RISC V microcontroller. So, I think it's like kilobytes of memory, so you're not going to run like Linux on it, but you could run a op real time operating system on it, and they're, they're quite cheap. Uh, and I think. Uh, do they also have the. S they match the STM peripherals or? Okay, so they also have the SDM32 peripherals, so basically the things you're used to on SDM32, but with a RISC-V core as well from Giga Devices. Hmm? Cheaper without the LCD. Um, <clears throat> just want to point out, um, right now for my job, I play around with the ECP5 a bit. The, like, the eval board, you get one for 80 euro, like the ECP5 eval board. And also, like an interesting alternative for DRAM, it would be like HyperRAM, it's just... Uh, uh, DRAM with uh, interfaces uh, with uh, 13 I/O pins, so you, it's kind of like uh, optional SPI or something. So the the hyper RAM would be at least better than the uh, quad spy uh, SRAM. Yeah, so your DRAM or your DDR memory that takes up like 60, 70 I/Os. Yeah, so yeah. The hyper RAM is quite easy to implement, and it goes like up to 330 megabits uh, bandwidth. Okay. You lose some for protocol for reading and writing because it's not in the same lines they do I/O. So but how 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 would hyper RAM compare to uh, DDR memory? It's in between SDRAM okay. and DDR. Okay. Strength. Cool. Yeah. And what was the board that was eighty dollars? That you. It's CP five EVA board. Okay, from Lattice. It's on the Lattice page, okay. Yeah. Yes. But it's got an Arduino interface and PMOD uh, connectors. <coughs> I also okay. found uh, also HyperRAM uh, already PMOD modules that you can buy from some manufacturers, so that might be yeah. option to put something together for uh, yeah the yeah. So maybe with this Lattice uh, board from Lattice with the HyperRAM, we could maybe get Linux on LightX working with it or something yeah. like that. So if you don't get one of those patches, and it yeah, would yeah. make you poor. <laughs> yes, yeah. Cool. All right, cool, all right, thank you.